Well, good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. I'm coming to you from the Coming Home Network International in Central Ohio, and we're coming to you over EWTN Radio, which we are very thankful to be a part of. This weekly program in which we uh, invite a guest to join us to talk about a favorite verse, maybe a verse they never saw. In other words, we'll, we'll let you know what we mean by that in a moment, but a verse that awakened them to a deeper walk with Jesus Christ in his church, to the understanding of the fuller uh, depth of Catholic faith. That's what this program is all about. We have a website associated with the program, deepinscripture.com, where you can find out all kinds of great things about this program, all the archived shows, even some of the notes from our earlier programs. Before I even introduce our guest today, I want to remind you that we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to give us a call with a question, our phone number is 800 664 5110. The regular Coming Home Network International phone number is 740 450 1175. Or you can write me an email at Marcus, M A R C U S, at deepinscripture.com. If we get either a phone call or an email during the show, we'll try and, and fit it in. Otherwise, we'll, we'll answer it off, offline. We, we want to hear from you because I want to know whether these broadcasts are an encouragement to your faith. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Thigpen. He's a great friend. He's been on the program before. The reason Paul is joining us today is because the scheduled guest, Dr. Rice, uh, called in sick this morning, and we'll schedule him another time. And Paul happened to be here at the offices, so it was of the Lord. And so it's great to have him join us on the show. The reason that Dr. Thigpen was here at the Coming Home Network is that Dr. Paul Thigpen is now the senior editor, the director of CH Resources for the Coming Home Network. Uh, if you go to the website, you'll see the books that we publish, a variety of resources, and Paul has come on the staff to focus on all of our publications to make sure they're in line with the church and that they're always an encouragement to your faith. Dr. Thigpen is a former evangelical pastor, best-selling author, award-winning journalist, and popular Catholic apologist who has published 37 books. You know, Paul, when do you find the time? 37 books in a wide variety of genre and subjects. He has served on the theology faculties of several colleges and universities. He's the past editor of the Catholic Answer, nationally bi-monthly, national bi-monthly magazine that answers questions about the Catholic faith. Dr. Thigpen graduated from Yale University in 1977, summa cum laude, and with a Robert W. Woodruff Fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, where he earned an MA and a PhD in historical theology. He presently serves on the National Advisory Council of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and is the director of CH Resources for the Coming Home Network International. And, and uh, we'll have Paul join us in just a moment. Paul was, uh, uh, you know, under the gun to come up with a verse for today because he hadn't expected to join us on the radio, but he, he picked one out because a particular verse a section of verses that are, are very key to his own journey of faith, and I think they're important even today in this world of moral confusion, not just amongst non-Christian versus Christian, but amongst Christians, moral confusion. It's actually one of the reasons that my wife Marilyn and I came to become Catholic is because of the prevalence and growing disease of moral confusion amongst Christian traditions and in our particular one that uh, from the top down we couldn't agree on major issues amongst heads of denominations down to the pew. Is it that confusion, what is right or wrong? Well, this is the issue of the whole moral question. We're only going to look at one specific issue yet is distinctively Catholic that sets Catholics apart from other Christian traditions but is very, very important. And so Paul chose 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Let me read that for you. We'll take a break, and then Dr. Thigpen will join us. But those of you listening from non-Catholic traditions, I'd like to ask you, what do you do with these verses? Whether you're a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, a Baptist, Assembly of God, Pentecostal, what do you do with these verses. Verse 16 and 17, 1 John. 
If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. I do not say that one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not mortal. You're listening to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grody. I'm joined today by Dr. Paul Thigpen, and you're hearing us on EWTN, your global Catholic radio network. Don't forget to watch the Journey Home program with Marcus Grody on EWTN. Each week, Marcus meets new guests who have journeyed to the Catholic faith from many backgrounds. Be challenged and encouraged as they witness to how their love for the truth of Jesus Christ has brought them into full communion with the Catholic Church. That's the Journey Home program on EWTN, live on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If you enjoy the Journey Home television program on EWTN, you'll want to purchase a copy of Marcus Grody's book, Journey's Home. Journey's Home contains the conversion stories of men and women who, as a result of their surrender to Jesus Christ, heard a call to follow him more completely in the Catholic Church. Many of them were Protestant pastors or missionaries. Others were laymen who, though working in secular jobs, took their calling to serve Christ in the world very seriously. To order your copy of Marcus Grody's book, Journey's Home, simply visit our website at www.chresources.com or call us toll-free at 1-800-664-5110. Welcome back to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grody, joined today by Dr. Paul Thigpen. Hello, Paul. Hello, Marcus. How are you? Well, I'm great. Usually when I'm saying that, I'm talking to somebody over the phone line way across the world, but here you are three feet from me, so it's great to have you in the studio. (laughs) It's great to be here. Let me take the time also publicly to thank you for joining us as the uh, senior editor, director of CH Resources. Uh, But, you know, take a moment, if you would, as our new editor, to talk to the folk about CH Resources, if you would. What's the significance of, of our publishing house, and why does the Coming Home Network even have one? You know, we're, our mission is is focused as, as a ministry altogether, as an apostolate, to help folks from outside the Catholic Church or clergy to come home to the Catholic Church. And there are other things that kind of come out of that, but that's that's our focus. And so our resources are to help those people and to help those who know those people or those people who could be in that position to come on home. And so that's that's really is what that's what sets apart CH Resources from from many other publishing concerns that may be broader or have a different niche. Our niche is to to be a resource to people who need to come home, clergy who need to come home, either by purchasing our our materials or by other folks getting what we have and giving it to them. Yeah, that uh, it, it, I would say one of the uniquenesses of the of CH Resources is that most of those who write the books as well as edit the books are converts to the Catholic faith. We've been outside the church and we know that certain things that have a Catholic slant sound differently to those outside the church. And so our focused audience are those outside the church, helping them understand Catholic, the fullness of Catholic doctrine. Yes, and you might say we're bilingual <laughs> in a yeah. way. I've often thought, you know, the uh, I was a, an evangelical pastor, and we had a certain lingo that we used, and there's a certain Catholic lingo, and sometimes people are talking past each other, and it helps to have someone from that background who's now Catholic, who can speak both languages, so to speak, because uh, so much of the, so much of the, so many of the barriers, so much of the uh, difficulty in making that journey, can be uh, can be eased if you begin to understand what church is really teaching rather than, you know, mis- getting miscommunication because you don't understand the language. That's interesting in relationship even to the text that we're looking at, because one of the problems that all of us have, I think, it might be just me, but that all of us, I think, have, and that is what I've called this, the, the sin of projection, mm-hmm. which is that we, we really don't know how other people think. We, we think we do, right? We think we do, but we really don't. And what we often do, we'll read into other people's mm-hmm. actions what we might be thinking if we were doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. We see somebody doing something or we see somebody else saying that something is right or wrong and we don't know what's in their head. So we read into them the understanding that we have. And the reason that I think that connects to this passage we're looking at is when we try and understand, for example, if we're not a Catholic and we're trying to understand what Catholics understand as sin, what Catholic teachers understand as sin. And when you're coming at it and looking at it from a Pentecostal, as you were, or as I was a Presbyterian, Lutheran, trying to see that, we may not understand what Catholics understand by yeah. mortal, venial sin, because we don't have a mental file folder where to put that. Mm-hmm. You chose this passage, Paul. Talk about it in general before we dig in. But why did this passage connect with your background? Well, Marcus, I came from a tradition that either said explicitly or trusted implicitly that all sin is basically the same in God's eyes, that, and in its effects even eventually, that ultimately that it's, it's just all sin. And therefore we shouldn't try to rank sins or try to even distinguish so much between sins. And uh, when I first read this passage seriously, carefully, I thought, this, the Bible is making a very clear and serious distinction between sin that leads to death or mortal sin and sin that does not, and in its, in its consequences. And once that hit me, that that is a biblical notion, that that's from, that's the Lord speaking, I have to understand that. The wider implication was, and that also means then, if I understand this right, that, that salvation isn't just a matter of faith, that here we're talking about actions, sins, works, one way or another, that are influencing whether we are saved or not. Yeah, this is very important. I I didn't hear this back when I was a Presbyterian pastor. I was very much an evangelical. I was of the, you know, the four or five spiritual law ilk, uh, very much of the Billy Graham crowd and believed in once saved, always saved. And, you know, the old, the old spiritual laws, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. But, but you're separated from sin. And the verse from scripture that we would use for example, when we use the Roman road. The verse comes from Romans that says, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and it goes on. But the assumption there is this underlying understanding of sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we immediately interpret that, you know, every little sin is a proof that we're separated from God, we're damned, and, and we, there's nothing we can do about it except for the mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, how did this start? I mean, where did this idea that every sin is equal or equally bad come from? I think you have to find roots in Luther, for sure, in Martin Luther. His, uh, his approach to sin, he, was, he, he talked about how even the best of our works are sinful in God's sight. They're, they're, they're of no use at all coming to God, and that, uh, and I think that that attitude that he had, that you just kind of take everything that's wrong, lump it all together, and, and push it to the extreme. It is, it's dirty rags in God's sight. It's your best works are horribly sinful <laughs> to him, even the best thing you do, that we couldn't really do anything good that didn't have this mixture of horrible sin in it. And he, you know, he was given to hyperbole in speaking. He would often exaggerate, but he, sa- he would say it, and he would write it. And I think uh, eventually that had to have some impression on the way the Protestant tradition began to look at sin. Hmm. Because I'm trying to look back in my own pastorate to try and remember. It's been years now. Was there any sense in which I saw any level of sin? I mean, there was a white lie, you know, uh, that we might say, and maybe it's as a dad, you know, my son is, you know, I'm, I'm planning a birthday party, let's say, for him. And my son looks at me very straight in the eye and says, Dad, are you planning a birthday party for me? And I'm thinking, wait, it's a surprise party. Do I tell him or do I lie? Yeah, I might white lie. Oh, no, I'm not planning a party for it because I'm going to surprise him. Okay, it's a white lie. All right, is that good or bad? The level of badness of that? And then you go, if you start from there, I'm talking about the lowest level you could imagine. I'm, I'm just being a loving dad or whatever, all the way up to abortion murder, uh, adultery, all of these kinds of issues. There's a, I'm trying to remember if as a pastor, I saw at least in my mind, 
that some of these were more heinous than others. Do you remember looking back? Did you have any gradation in your mind on sinfulness when you were serving as a pastor, Paul? I remember what we were always taught was that to, in the eyes of man, you know, we'd say that it looks, things look different because you'd have to, you know, you'd have to admit, of course, <laughs> if my son goes out and shoots somebody or he just stays out too late in the curfew, that, you know, those are different things. Our experience would tell us there are different kinds of sins in their gravity and, and in other ways as well. And our whole legal system, every legal system is built on the notion that offenses have different kinds of gravity and deserve different kinds of punishment. Uh, and so all that would press against this notion that all sins alike, but the comeback would always be, well, that's in man's eyes. In God's eyes, it's all alike. And I think the consequence of that was you went one of two ways. The overly scrupulous would do kind of what Luther started out with because he was just wrestling with this yeah. terrible sense of shame and guilt, and that's why he came up with the notion he did that uh, that is all horrible and then I'm, I'm damned or I'm lost or or else just I can't do anything and and so I have to just totally give up and not even work it, try to do good things. Um, either that or what more often in our culture what happens is that it all goes the other way, that if all sins alike and there's a lot of things that you think, oh, they're not really that bad, then you tend to not think that anything's really that bad. Unless it happens to you, and then that's the other thing. If yeah. somebody does a terrible sin against you, an injury, or someone you love, you know, drunk driver kills someone you love, then all of a sudden it changes your perspective. But until something like that happens, we tend to lighten all of it because we put it all in one mass, and it's either really bad or not so bad. Yeah, and I'm wondering, I'm not sure w which particular theology you were in, but from my perspective, there's a, a progress in theology in a sense in which that before I was saved in Jesus— all sins were equal, and they were all separated me from God. That was the spiritual law. But because I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, by grace I'm now saved, and there's nothing that can separate from God. So all of a sudden, every sin is equal, but it's covered with the righteousness of Jesus. So in a sense, it didn't matter. I didn't say that, right. but there was a, a, an underlying... Um, you could start writing off the white lies, the little things, because in your mind, you're they're covered with the righteousness yeah, of Jesus. Pentecostals would say, "We Pentecostals, it's under the blood, it's under the blood, <laughs> whatever it is, it's under the blood, it's okay." Or I would take claim another verse from First John earlier in the passage, where he says in First John chapter one, verse nine, "If any, if if you can, if we confess our sins." He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I mean, they're from the same book. You take every sin that's in your life and just put it in one big bag, say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, and then claim it cleansed and move on. I mean, it was that kind of simple. That's one way to look at it, apart from understanding it sacramentally and all that. Do you remember, though, what you did specifically with this passage back then? Well, what it did is it, it made me start questioning the whole notion of faith and works. And so you actually, I'm, when you saw it. this before, when you were pastoring and you would study this passage, right. you were taking it seriously back I then. started taking it seriously. Okay. I said, I've got to start looking more seriously at not just the effects of sin, that there could be something like a mortal sin, but, but that all sin is not alike, and that if there is a sin that leads to death, there seems to be eternal death, and you know that it, our works do have something to do with our salvation. It's not just some, certainly not just some intellectual ascent, or even just some expression of confidence in God. And this was during while well, I was in grad school in historical theology, so it, it pressed me to start looking more at the Catholic moral tradition, hmm. with all of its categories and uh, distinctions and nuances, which can get very complicated. But if you approach it well, it becomes very helpful when you start making, understanding things like the role of intention and the object of the sin and the culpability and that whole issue. It's, uh, you begin to have a much more realistic, I would say, and nuanced understanding of what sin is, of the fact that it has consequences. You know, that that's another thing. The tradition I came from, it's all forgiven. And then, okay, so the guilt's gone. But it wasn't until I started reading Catholic moral theology that I realized sin has not, has more consequences than just guilt. Mm 
And those other consequences need to be fixed. And that's what the whole notion of purgation, eventually purgatory, but even in this life. It just turned upside down, my whole notion of, of sin, of vice, of virtue, all those things. Uh, what I'd like us to do, Paul, is to kind of analyze this passage first before we start talking about what the church teaches about moral and venial sin, all right? Just to make sure that we're not just reading back into it, but let's look at it, what it says there. And um, before we take a break, I'd like one thing I'd like to look at before we go to the break is in that very first passage, if anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin. What I find interesting about that passage, Paul, a couple things, is, and talk about this if you would, number one, John is not addressing this at the person that's doing the sin. He's talking about us seeing others doing it. What's the, what do you think is the significance of that? And second of all, it seems that he's presuming his audience already knows this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't give an explanation of the differences. He, it's just kind of a reminder as if he's saying, and, and as you know, there's a sin that leads to death. I'm not talking about that. We've talked about that before, it sounds like, uh, but... Uh, I'm going to talk about this situation. What does that say about sola scriptura? Well, he's obviously depending on our oral tradition here, as St. Paul often did in his letters. He'll sometimes explicitly say, as I said before, and talk about something. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty clear here that you needed, that someone reading this letter had to have some kind of background in the oral tradition of what was going on. Yeah, I mean, the Christian faith had been passed down. Mm -hmm. The majority of what they considered the foundation for what they believed. They had received from Paul and others, in this case, John, uh, we presume, that they, but they've already received it, and John is able to build on what they already know to clarify something. Because when you, th when you think of that passage, if anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, up until this passage in John, he's never mentioned any of that. But he's answering a question as if someone said, what do I do? If I see my brother committing something that is mortal or something that isn't, what do I do? It's as if he's responding to a letter that he had already received from these people in this congregation. They already know about the distinction of mortal and not mortal sin. And so that leaves us here trying to, well, what did he mean by it? Because there's no explanation. But it's assumed. When I was a pastor, I ignored this. I even helped write a commentary on 1 John, and I don't think I dealt with this mm. in the commentary because it didn't match my background. Let's take a break, Paul. When we come back, let's, let's dig a little deeper into this passage and try and see if we can get the different sides of mortal and non-mortal sin that this congregation assumed from their, their foundation in oral tradition. You're listening to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grodi, joined by Dr. Paul Thigpen, and you're hearing us on EWTN, your global Catholic radio network. EWTN.com is online with program information, the latest news, Pope Benedict XVI, plus tools for living the faith like prayers, Catholic Q&A, and other resources. Log on today to EWTN.com. The Coming Home Network International and Marcus Grodi invite you to join us for our eighth annual Deep in History Conference coming this fall to Columbus, Ohio. This year, our focus will be on the authenticity of the sacred scriptures as we ask, how firm is your foundation? Join us the weekend of October 22nd as we bring together another exciting list of guest speakers. For more information, go to deepinhistory.com or call us at 800-664-5110. Welcome back to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grodi, joined today by Dr. Paul Thinkpen. I want to re remind you that next time on The Journey Home, our guest will be Father Christopher Phillips. He's returning. It'll be an open line program that this coming Monday night on EWTN television, Monday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, our guest, Father Christopher Phillips. All right, Paul, let me read the passage again for the audience that's just joining us. 1 John chapter 5, 16 through 17. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. 
there is sin which is mortal, I do not say that one is to pray for that. So the point is, we just made it that it seems that that John, the Apostle John, is speaking to this congregation about something which they already seem to know, that there is a distinction in sins, some which is mortal and some which isn't. And it's as if he's answering a question about what they're to do when they see one of their brothers. Now, before going farther, this, the, the fact that he says brother is significant. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, what is the significance about the use of the word brother in this context? Well, he's correcting another Christian, not not a pagan who's not going to share his understanding of sin and its consequences or of, of the means of grace. I mean, that's the problem, is what do you do when someone who's accepted Christ, who's received baptism, is now a part of the body, uh, has the graces, commits a sin? In this case, the first thing is, well, what about when he does a non-mortal sin? You know, what do we do? Uh, And before we answer that quickly, Paul, can you think of any, we don't have all the oral tradition that he presumed in this. We don't know exactly what they received, but was, was there any indication of the teachings of Jesus to this level of sins, mortal versus non-mortal sin? Well, certainly you have some indications from our Lord's teaching about differences in the severity of sin when he's talking about differences in punishment. In one place talking about how some will receive many stripes and, and others a few. Uh, Luke 12 in particular, Luke 12, 47 through 48, um, one of the things that the church eventually developed in its understanding of mortal sin was that one of the conditions has to be for it to be mortal is that you have to have full knowledge of what you're doing. And there the Lord talks about a servant who knew his master's will but didn't make ready and then one who did not know and that the punishment would be more severe for the one who knew his master's will and didn't do it. And that's, you know, that, that points to that notion that knowledge is an important part of um, how grave the sin about and how the consequences of the sin are and, and the punishment it receives. So you've got you know those kinds of indicators that um, that Jesus did not consider the consequences of all sins to be the same, the gravity to be different. Well, one thing I, I came to appreciate in my own journey to the Catholic faith, which I didn't appreciate as a non-Catholic when I was a pastor, but really the the foundation for this understanding comes from the Old Testament, because in the Levitical laws, all through, there are certain sins that require a different punishment than others. Some require the sacrifice of a dove. You know, some require the sacrifice of an ox. Some require stoning. Some require getting thrown out of the community. Some are you're out of the community for months until you can come back in. And so this idea of some sins are worse than others was a part of the air they breathed. Surely. And, and I often think, Paul, did you find this you know, journey that when I was a Protestant, if the if the New Testament didn't directly talk about liturgy, for example, I assumed, well, they must not have liturgy. And then I came to realize, no, maybe the problem was they didn't have a problem with liturgy. They didn't have to write about it in the letters. And so they didn't talk about it. It was there. And, one, and I'm wondering if, for example, in the structure of the church, it parallels the Old Testament structure because that was the air they breathed. That's what they accepted. Do they get the same concept of sin in the same way? I think so. And I think uh, you look at the words of Jesus about someone in the church who's sitting within the church, and they, you go to him, and then if he, that doesn't work, you, you go to the elders. And, and, and it's very clear that at the end, he's, he's got to be like a Gentile to you. He's, he's cast yeah. out. That certainly is showing kind of different levels of culpability and severity of the sin with its consequences. And... And having him outside the church, it's like, you know, excommunication. That's kind of a recognition of you're being cut off from something here. That, all that would have to be in the background, I would think, as well. In this passage, then, John gives an interesting answer. Uh, talk about this with our audience. You know, he says, if anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin. Now, w- where'd venial come from? It means lesser. It's, it's lesser. So a lesser sin. Yeah. Okay. So a lesser sin, which would kind of be here, but we're not going to read the word in, but that's kind of what we're talking about. Less than mortal. 
all right, not a mortal sin. He will ask and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. And I do not say that one is to pray for that. Talk about that answer. Well, you know, I think we have to look at it, I think, in the context of the few verses before it. Uh, and this is the confidence we have. Is that verse 14? Which we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the request made of him. So that's the context. He's talking about asking you know, intercession and petition and having a confidence in what that we're gonna, God's going to answer our prayer. But then it's as if he's, he's noting an exception. And again, we're talking about it. He seems to be replying to perhaps a, a request for clarification. If anyone sees his brother committing what's not a mortal sin, then he'll ask and God will give him life. So this, is, this goes along with the general category that your prayers are going to have an effect for that person, for his venial sin. He, the venial sin is not going to keep him from receiving the life that you're praying for. But if it's mortal, if it's mortal, your prayers are not going to be able to change that condition. And the implication there for me is because he's going to have to repent of that. And, of course, eventually it's clear in the church he's going to have to repent of it sacramentally. Hmm. And that's part of what I'm seeing here, that he's just telling people, okay, ask and have confidence, you'll have it. But if someone's someone's committed that kind of serious sin and you're asking for the graces to flow or whatever you're asking, keep in mind you may not see an answer to that because something's got to happen in him. It's that serious a sin that the, the life, the grace, the life of grace in his soul is going to have to be restored before you can see those kinds of consequences. That's how I see it anyway. And, and I'm wondering if it connects with an earlier passage then because um, all through First John, he's talking about authentic love, right? Mm -hmm. And he'll say that if you say you love God but hate your brother, you're a liar. And so it's talking about our need to love one another and to go out. He who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So part of it involves authentic love for our brother. So in, in the context of this, if you see a brother that is he's doing a lesser sin, you should pray for him. You should. And if you pray, God will hear and he'll heal. If he's doing something worse, maybe there's something a little more you ought to do besides just praying for him. <laughs> yeah, that. Is that kind of what maybe he's saying here? I think it could be. And I, it, uh, but again, I think he's also saying that don't expect that your prayer is going to kind of override something that a ser serious mortal sin means he has got to have a kind of repentance and grace, come, the life of grace being restored in his soul. And you can kind of pray that that'll happen, but that's it's not going to release your prayers. Not going to release the graces to him that it would, if this if the sin were that serious. That it's it's talking about how serious mortal sin yep. is. That it really blocks all kinds of great access to grace. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier passage from Jesus, which basically outlines what they would have assumed at this time is what you do in the church when you see a brother that's mm -hmm. sinning, whether it's against you or not, is that you are to go to him and talk to him. And if he won't listen to you, then you bring somebody else with you. And if he won't listen to you, you the whole church needs to know. Now, let me ask you this. That's an embarrassing thing to bring the whole church in if somebody's committing a mortal sin. Is that an unloving thing for the church to do? Well, Jesus wouldn't tell us to do something that's not loving. We... Uh, when it's, when it's tell it to the church, that doesn't necessarily mean stand up in mass and tell, tell the whole congregation, the, the representatives of the church. But, but the point is, he, he's, he's underlying how bad mortal <laughs> sin is. Oh, yes. Because in the end, if he doesn't, fall, if he doesn't uh, change in the light of the church, he's, he's saying treat him as a pagan. So really, you can't, the whole church is going to know. Oh, yeah. So yeah. the point is that a venial sin is treated one way. A mortal sin. And I'm reminded of the passage where Paul, a similar situation where at, in Corinth, mm -hmm. Paul's mm -hmm. dealing with a problem there, and they're telling him to kick the brother out. In fact, they say, cast him to Satan. or What's the words that they use in that context? Turn him over to Satan for a while. Yeah, to, what's the reason for that? For this. It's, it's for this reason, that it's such a serious thing. It's obviously the consequences it's had in his soul. 
are such that it needs some kind of serious dealing. He needs to be confronted with, with the horror that is mortal sin. And that's his best chance for repentance. The, the reason I'm adding that to this is because, uh, and maybe I'm, you, you correct me, Paul, you can reach across and slap me if, I, if I'm not teaching this correctly, but it would seem to me that what he's saying here also is that if you see a brother committing a mortal sin, it's our responsibility one to another to reach out to him so that he changes. In other words, it's not merely just saying, well, I'm going to pray for you. Prayer for venial sin, mm -hmm. we should be, because he's not, I don't think, it, it almost sounds like if someone's doing a mortal sin, you don't need to pray for him. Yeah, right. and that's obviously not the, not the intent. Yeah, the, the intent is, of course, pray for him, but in this case, you, if you really love your brother based on 1 John 1, 2, 3, and 4, then you've got to do something but your prayer is not going to be sufficient to take away that penalty for living a life apart from, from Christ. At the time that, I'm trying to think, at the time that this would have been written, Paul, could we have enumerated what they would have considered mortal sin? Oh, from the tradition, I think you would say, uh, from the earliest traditions we have, and, and this is not so, and of course this is quite early. Yeah. But uh, certainly sexual sin, adultery, uh, certainly murder, uh, apostasy. Those three probably would have, I don't think anyone would have argued were mortal sin. It's going to take a while, of course, after this for the church to begin to look carefully at all kinds of the aspects of sin and the culpability and, the, you know, how, how much does someone know and how much do they give their consent but certainly those three categories. In fact, there was a time in some part of the church where, where people were saying, no, we don't think God can forgive those things. Murder, adultery, apostasy. We don't think God can forgive that. That's one reason why eventually in the Apostles' Creed, you have, I believe in the forgiveness of sins yep. because there are some folks who lacked confidence that God could forgive those things. Yeah, the, the, the sin of uh, against the Holy Spirit was one that, what does that mean? You know, and, and have I committed that? Does that person commit that? Um, can they be forgiven of the sin against the Holy Spirit? I mean, that's a verse that uh, even to this day, there are different opinions mm -hmm. on, on what that means. And in a sense, you know, we understand that, that verse to mean that if you choose to turn your back on God, if you choose that, to say, I don't believe in God, uh, I don't need God, um, then you are choosing the wrong place. It isn't God condemning you to a different place. God doesn't condemn anyone to hell. He gives people what they've chosen. And to, the unforgivable sin is, this, is the sin of the sinner who refuses to be forgiven. I mean, that's really at the heart mm -hmm. of it. Who says to God, I, either I don't believe in you so I don't have your forgiveness, or yeah, I believe you, but I don't want your forgiveness or need it. Anyone can be forgiven who wants, who asks, to seeks the forgiveness. But there are those who in the end refuse the forgiveness. And forgiveness doesn't work unless it's accepted. It's got to be. Because it's the restoration of a relationship. And that's what forgiveness is about. It's, it's the restoration of the relationship with God. So if you've got the person on the other side, God says, I'll receive you back. I will, you know, I've, I've paid the price for your guilt. And the other person says, I don't want the relationship. I don't want to be forgiven. Then, of course, there is no forgiveness. The, the relationship is not restored. I find it interesting. I, I have in front of me the the Protestant study Bible that I always used. I still use it because uh, in the notes and on the side, it, it helps remind me of how I understood some of these passages as a, a Protestant, which always, even as I look back, kind of strike me funny that if I really believed in sola scriptura and that the Bible was clear, then why are there necessary explanatory notes in my Bible to make sure I understood it from a Protestant perspective. But I did find it interesting that this particular passage, 1 John 5, 16, has no note by it. So it, in other words, we didn't deal with it in a footnote, but it did have a, a you know, a, a connecting verse, which mm -hmm. it often mm -hmm. does, to another passage in Scripture, which I avoided like the plague from my Protestant Calvinist perspective because the section that it connects to, which I find it interesting that this is the, the connection, and Paul, you'll recognize this, and I'm wondering what you did with Hebrews 6, 4, 
through 6. Because the writer of Hebrews says, For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they then commit apostasy, since they crucify the Son of God on their own account and hold him up to contempt. Now, how does that verse connect with what we're doing? And what did you do with that verse when you, back when you were a Pentecostal minister? <laughs> I, remember, I remember running from it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It, was, uh, it was so frightening because it, uh, it really talked about the possibility that someone could become incorrigible. Un- unable to be corrected, that they would, could get to that place. And uh, and so, I, I mean, really, I remember reading it and saying, I don't know what that means, I better go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I, the way I explained it as a pastor was, if Paul is saying, for it is impossible to restore again those who've been baptized, is what it's saying, received the Holy Spirit, they've learned it all, and then cast it aside, commit apostasy. And, and the point is, I knew people. Exactly. Yeah. I knew people that I had ministered to, I had catechized, I've, I heard their, their, their uh, profession of faith, I've seen them become committed, active, even leaders in the church, and then before you know it, they're off way in left field and they're gone, even to the point of denying Jesus, mm-hmm. explain they never really believed in the first place, I mean, they're whatever they're doing. And how do I explain that when you're coming from a perspective of once saved, always saved? Exactly, and, that, and that's where... When I finally did begin to deal with the verse, the notion I'd been taught of once saved, always saved, fell apart. I just said, it's not biblical. <laughs> this is so yeah. clear. Because if these things don't apply to someone who's been saved, the taste of <laughs> the things to come and the Holy, particulars of the Holy Spirit and all that, then who is saved? Yeah. Because the argument would try to be, well, they were never really saved in the first place. But... Yeah, they had con- this, they this, had confessed with their lips, but they didn't believe with their right. heart. You know, that's kind of the. the but this theory. passage obviously doesn't apply yeah. to those people. These are the folks who have received the partake of the Holy Spirit and like, you know, the age to come. It's definitely not them. And then the ones, like you said, that I knew personally, a close oh, yeah. Christian friend who had helped to lead me in my early Christian years. Has been as solid as anybody ever was. Convinced he was Christian. Later on, he apostatizes and gives it all up. And I remember thinking, okay, if someone were to say. Number one, you can be saved and know that you're saved. And number two, you're always saved. And number three, someone like him has never been saved. Then my thought was, okay, well, there was a time when he thought he was, was, he was saved. Now you're saying he never really was. How am I going to be any different? Are you going to be any different? How can we be certain? How can any of us be certain that we're saved? Yeah. If this man who was so convinced that everyone around him was, and, and all along we're saying now he wasn't. Um, yeah. In yeah. fact, the reason I find this interesting in my study Bible, this is this particular Protestant study Bible that I have here, comes from the once saved, always saved Calvinist perspective. And if it links these per- verses, if it links 1 John five sixteen to this, it's basically saying, you could say, that the reason John is saying that you don't pray for someone who's in mortal sin is because it's impossible to bring them yeah. back, because that's what this writer is saying in this. Is it... How is it, on the one hand, impossible to bring back someone who's committed apostasy, when at the other hand we recognize that all things are possible with God? Paul, <laughs> I mean, what do you do there? I th- I think it's basically saying and impossible in the sense that um, that there are some people who've gotten to the place by their own choice where it's not going to happen. I mean, because we know thing. from a pastoral standpoint, in fact, I think some of our audience know, they know people that were brought up in the church and have gone way out there, and we know how impossible it is to bring them back. It, you know, they don't listen, they don't mm-hmm. want to hear, and Paul isn't saying in this, or the writer of Hebrews, which I still assume is Paul, but the writer here is not saying that it's that God can't bring them back. That's what I'm, I always understood mm-hmm. this, but no matter what we do, we know people that that's not going to happen. So we'd pray for them, except John says, don't pray for them. <laughs> and my point there, and we're going to take a break, because I want to come back and hear what the church says about this. My point there is that's the problem of sola scriptura, that apart from the wider tradition of the church, guided by the Holy Spirit, you encounter verses in Scripture that you can't 
figure out on your own. Mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you agree, Paul? I mean, that's, oh, this yeah. is a great example of that. This is one reason why I chose it. It drove me to look to the wider tradition to help interpret it. All right, when we come back, Paul, let's have you share that uh, from the Catechism. You're listening to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grody, joined by Dr. Paul Thigpen, and you're hearing us on EWTN, your global Catholic radio network. The Coming Home Network International is a nonprofit Catholic lay apostolate dedicated to helping Protestant clergy and laity come home to the Catholic Church. It was founded by Marcus Grodi, the host of this program, as well as the Journey Home television program on EWTN. If you are on the journey and interested in learning more about the Coming Home Network International or know someone who's thinking of becoming Catholic, please visit our website, www.chnetwork.org, or contact us at 1-800-664-5110. Welcome back to Deep in Scripture. This is your host, Marcus Grota. I am joined today by Dr. Paul Thigpen. I, I just want to remind a couple of you out there, I've, I've got a... a uh, a message from Carl in California and Chris from San Antonio. We might be able to get to your questions beforehand. They don't really exactly fit with the topic we're looking at. We'll make sure and respond to you by email otherwise, but uh, we'll see in a moment. Maybe we can get those for you in the program. Paul, okay, from a Catholic perspective, looking at the big tradition, how do we understand pretty much what, what, what John is saying in this passage? Well, I turn to the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a very reliable a uh, place to look. And in, uh, in section 1849, let me just uh, take the definition of sin first there. It says, sin is an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is failure in genuine love for God and neighbor caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. It, it wounds the nature of man and injures human solidarity. It has been defined as an utterance, a deed, or a desire contrary to the eternal law. So with that notion of sin in mind, then another section then goes on to distinguish between moral and venial. In 1854, it says, Sins are rightly evaluated according to their gravity, their seriousness, their weight. Those are my comments. The distinction between mortal and venial sin, already evident in Scripture, the passage we referred to in 1 John, became part of the tradition of the Church. It is corroborated by human experience. Mortal sin, is the definition, destroys charity in the heart of man by a grave violation of God's law. It turns man away from God, who is his ultimate end and his beatitude, by preferring an inferior God, good to him. Venial sin, on the other hand, allows charity to subsist, love, even though it offends and wounds it. So mortal sin, it goes on to say, attacks the vital principle within us, with charity, and necessitates then a new initiative of God's mercy and a conversion of heart normally accomplished within the setting of sacrament of reconciliation. So mortal sin is, is so grave that it actually is a turning away from God, not just a kind of an offense against God or a wounding of our love for God and others, but serious enough that it's turning us away from him. And it leads to what you might call the, the death of the life of grace in our soul. Hmm. And that... It needs to be restored then by an initiative of God himself, which he's willing to do, but we have to respond in certain ways. And normally, for the Catholic, it means sacramental reconciliation, going to the sacrament of, of penance and confessing that to God. I uh, believe that, at least my re reading of the mercy of God, is that when a person commits a mortal sin, and maybe more than one mortal sin, maybe a continuous series of mortal sins in which they now have really separated themselves from God. And that my reading of God's mercy, it doesn't mean that God doesn't no longer care for them, mm -hmm. that God doesn't continue to surround them with mercy, that God doesn't continue to use people and opportunities and books and whatever resources are out there to try and shake this person back. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is it rests on our will, doesn't it? It rests on our individual choice to turn. And isn't that why pride 
is the worst of sins. It's the most likely to keep us from turning back, yeah, from admitting our need, admitting our, our wickedness, our, uh, our brokenness. And yeah, it's true. I mean, just like a person who's who's never been a Christian, who's never been baptized outside of the community of faith, outside of faith, God loves them deeply. He gave His Son for them, and uh, and He surrounds them with prevenient mercies, mercies that go before to try to bring them in. And so, if they come to Him and they're baptized and then they they turn away from Him again, that doesn't mean He's going to leave them alone any more than He did before they they came in. Hmm. But there's there's got to be a response on our part, and that's one reason why continued serious sin or even venial sin that becomes accumulative <laughs> um, that is such a dangerous thing because it can wound and harden our conscience so much that it lessens the possibility the likelihood that we will recognize where we are and, and our need will be less yeah. much less likely to come back to him and he'll he'll have to resort to more serious means to get our attention which is usually some kind of serious adversity yeah, in the context of Scripture as well as the teaching of the church, there's that, that, that constant call for us to be uh, acting out in love for our brothers and sisters who may not know the faith as well, may be living in sin. Maybe they don't realize that what they have chosen is, in fact, mortal sin. Um, there have been different theologians that have tried to explain away this issue like with the, the new thing called the fundamental option, you know, trying yeah. to in some ways say that if you really love Christ, you can't actually commit a, a mortal sin anymore. Well, you know, that's, uh, I think, a flawed philosophy. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing that I remember, uh, Paul, I know that you were very committed to helping us remember the story of the, the martyrs mm -hmm. in Savannah, right? In the Georgia in the martyrs. Georgia, mm -hmm. And when you think about them, didn't they, in a way, give their life to help the ignorant understand this issue, that well, they needed to turn in holiness to God? And that, that they were, there were sins so serious that knowing that they would probably die to confront them, nevertheless, they did. The five Franciscan missionaries, 1597, along the coast of Georgia, uh, they had ex had been teaching, sharing the gospel with Native uh, Americans there of the Huali tribe, and had uh, when they came into the church, they had to promise to give up polygamy, having multiple wives, because of the sanctity of marriage. And uh, one of them broke that promise, went back and announced he was going to take others, and a number of later events showed that, that uh, he wasn't just simply going back to a cultural <laughs> tradition, yeah. but he was, he was acting out of lust. And, uh, and they had to speak out against that, knowing that that they would probably lose their lives. They did. To me, that, that fills in the gap mm -hmm. in this passage. I mean, it wasn't just a non-mortal sin that they could pray for, take care of. It was a mortal sin. Prayer wouldn't just solve that problem. And they gave their lives to try and change that person and bring them back to a full relationship with God. You know, I, I see that mm -hmm. in my own. When I took as my patron saint coming in the church, Isaac Jokes, mm -hmm. because he was a Jesuit missionary that gave his life to bring the faith to the Huron Indians in Canada. The same thing. It wasn't merely enough for us to stay in France and pray for them. Yes, that's right. We had to give our lives. And that's what we need to do for one another. Uh, Paul, let's assume that there's somebody listening that really struggles with sin. W what should they do right now in the moments? What would you suggest to someone that thinks they're caught up in this? Well, if we're talking about Catholics, then, of course, the Lord has given us through the church the wonderful, wonderful sacrament of reconciliation. Head, head for the confessional right away. Yeah. Not for just mortal sin? Oh, all sin. Right, all sin. But, right. but of course, mortal sin right Be away. Because, as you said, even the littlest sin slowly numbs our conscience. Right. And, yeah, you can sink a battleship one spoonful of water at a time. And sometimes we do that with venial sins. All right, Paul, thank you for joining us today on, on Deep in Scripture. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure to be here. God bless you and all your listeners. All right, and, with, and those listening, I pray this has been an encouragement. Would you please join us next week on Deep in Scripture? If you have any thoughts about what we've talked about, any questions, please contact us, especially write me an email, marcus at deepinscripture.com. Those callers that uh, had questions that we'll try and get you to those. They didn't quite fit with our topic today, but we appreciate you calling in. You know, God bless you. It's a blessing to be together in the faith.
see you next week.